welcome to the Lebanon IBs Forum video series featuring interviews with key stakeholders in Lebanon, including politicians, economists, and civil society leaders, as well as members of the Lebanon diaspora. This series aims to highlight Lebanon's diverse voices, their views, and their work to address the chronic economic, fiscal, and political crises in Lebanon. Today, we cast a shining light on the woman factor in Lebanon's parliamentary elections, which took place May 15, exactly a month from today. This year, 118 women candidates ran for the elections, which is about a 37% increase since the last parliamentary elections. However, only eight women won seats in parliament, a very modest two seat increase since the last elections. So to discuss the woman factor in politics and, and women's political participation at large in Lebanon are two leading experts from Lebanon and the diaspora, Carmen Jiha and Lynn Munzer. Um, thank you so much, Carmen and Lynn, for joining us today. So Carmen, thank you. I'm going to turn to you, Carmen, for um, first your readout. You, you, you know, in addition to all the expert work that you're doing on women's issues, you're also an activist um, in Lebanon um, and have a, a, uh, a reading of what's going on um, on the political front in Lebanon. So what was your reading of the elections and the results and where are we today? Thank you, Marissa, for having me and for uh, shedding the light on Lebanon. Um, I think that the elections need to be seen as one juncture in a three year extreme context of a disaster that in fact didn't change much for Lebanon. We see a total regime resurgence, uh, similar to the way that the old guard refused to form a government after the explosion, despite pressure and the need to form a government. They took 13 months, similar to their behavior in terms of obstructing the investigation into the port. They were yet able to co opt the elections largely. I mean, with the exception of the advent of 13 new members of parliament that were able to break this um, break this path dependence. There's really today in Lebanon, a very shocking regime a resurgence a monopolizing of the state discourse, um, an utter incapacity and unwillingness to deal with the structural problem that led to both a garbage crisis and to the port exposing. Um, things have gotten so bad that I'm 37 years old. This is the first time I immigrate with no intention of ever going back. It is a horrible place controlled by a bunch of warlords and one of the worst places on the planet to be a woman right now. And these elections were another episode of politicians manipulating, bribing, vote buying in order to stay in power with the advent of some change, which we can talk about later. But this is my reading of the election. I cannot believe that they have still the resilience, these politicians to be able to go on TV and make promises on key issues like electricity and garbage and investigation into the port and still expect and still the world expect them to do something about it after 30 years. Thank you so much. That is a very sobering assessment, um, a little bit different from some of the other assessments that we've heard from our guests who had um, a slightly, I guess, more hopeful um, outlook precisely because you have 13 independent candidates that um, entered the field. But of course, um, it remains to be seen how they will organize, whether they will come together to address the more pressing and urgent issues, particularly with regards to the economy um, and uh, fiscal stability of the country. I want to turn to you, Lynn, to inject the woman factor. Um, you wrote a really good piece for um, us here at the Wilson Center, highlighting that the silver lining, um, and that's before the results came out, of those elections perhaps could be that we're seeing many more women entering the political field. Um, and running for uh, elections. Not, not all of them uh, won seats, only eight did. Um, so how, how, is, how has your assessment changed since the results came out? Yeah, I was optimistic and um, it's in the right place, I want to say. Uh, I totally agree with Carmen, the situation is not good. Uh, we are, 
and the hope with this government, uh, we don't have high hopes with, for the for this government, especially it's only the independent uh, winners where it's a very small portion from the group. However, on a woman level, eight is it's a big number. The thing is, it's not about how many women have succeeded. I was talking to Joelle. She's a um, she's a co-founder of Fifty Fifty. It's an organization that helped women. Um, highlight women participant in election she was telling me that on the ground 10 years ago even five years ago women considered being in a political sphere is a dirty business and they didn't want to be part of it however since this election a lot of women changed their perception and they uh there's viewing uh, they, they are motivated to, to become, uh, to participate in politics. We're gonna see more and more women involvement. They feel empowered, eight, five of them never been in politics, never been uh, in the parliament before, so which is impressive. We have eight very powerful, educated, um, well, I wanna say well-presented women. They are, they can be role models. So I'm still, hoping for the best eight women are not going to change the whole um the whole dynamic of uh, the parliament i know that i'm realistic but it's a hope it's a hope for the next election where they're gonna be we're gonna see more and more women uh it's a hope for other women to participate in different like municipality election and so on and this is how we're gonna change the whole dynamic Thank you for that. Um, Carmen, to um, just, I guess, comment on Lynn's assessment with regards to, um, you know, this barrier that seems to have been broken for women to enter the, you know, the political field, uh, with the exception, of course, of the more traditional way that they entered through their, you know, a deceased husband or a family member. Um, how did you see it on the ground from, from Beirut when you were there? You're involved in so many different, um, you know, activities on the ground with women's groups. So, what is your pulse on some of these, uh, some of this movement? Yeah. So, uh, just like I said, I think the elections and their results need to be read within a protracted context that is very extreme. So, this is one moment, and you know. A parliament is not going to change everything. That said, I think 13 uh, candidates stemming out of a revolution that are independent from the old guard can establish a new way of doing politics by being responsive and more uh, um, um, decent with their citizens. Uh, I, I, the last protest I attended, Elie Frizzle tried to run us over with his car. And members of parliament walk around with bodyguards shooting at people. So for sure, in terms of the political culture, yes, it's important and it's amazing that these brave and competent candidates made it through. In terms of the women, I have a huge problem. Number one, a 37% increase is only 10% of all candidates. Uh, I have a problem with the empowerment narrative. I don't think that we need to be taking women aside and training them so that they're empowered because in a country with structural violence, you can be extremely empowered, very empowered, very self-confident, very educated, but you can be legally raped and your rapist will escape, or you can walk on a street with no lights. So the issue with Lebanese women in politics is not that Lebanese women are different than their counterparts all over the world. On the contrary, women are super engaged in the public sphere, in syndicates, in unions, in local politics, in municipalities, a great deal. The problem is that the structures are extremely violent and corrupt, and it keeps women at bay. And this is what we need to be work on, working on. In parallel to celebrating the women who made it, we need to be today telling the story that more women are being trafficked in Lebanon, more women are being beaten to death in Lebanon, more women have lost their jobs in Lebanon. Even before COVID, women constituted a near 23%, not because women are not educated or they don't want to work or because they're scared of work, because of these structures. And these structures are manifest of a 30-year regime by warlords who, instead of being held accountable, were graced, were given suits and made to be ministers and parliamentarians. 
the issue of hope, hope is fleeting, but I think it's important to, to say what, what it, I'm always hopeful. And I think that we can help a lot, especially the new diaspora that left that is still, you know, half of our hearts and minds are still there. But I think it's very important that as we congratulate and celebrate the few that we made it, we remind ourselves that this is far from the norm and the battle is far from over. Yeah, it's, it's, it seems that there's a lot of work to be done, particularly addressing some of these um, structural barriers that you talked about. Um, and then you have um, uh, basically become very intimate with some of these structural uh, barriers in your research um, as, a, as a gender as, uh, expert, particularly when it uh, is related to women's economic participation. Um, what are some of these main barriers and how can um, with with this you know slither of hope um that we're you know hanging on to in this discussion um how can some of these be tackled um in parliament but also through other means within the political sphere this i have an answer to because uh, uh, lebanon like many countries it is structures and policies that open up the way for participation whether it's based on race or, or ethnicity we need inclusive political policies and inclusive economic policies that would automatically enable women to compete fairly with men and this can take 100 years to achieve but the work today the burden is not on women like me like you like anybody the burden is on decision makers for example in the political sphere to control things like campaign finance prohibit hate speech prohibit stereotyping on the media and put a ceiling in terms of financing your campaign so it's accessible to all in terms of the electoral law in terms of the marketplace you know inclusive recruitment retention and promotion policies for women equal pay, fair play, sexual harassment in the workplace. These are, this is where the burden of the effort today needs to go because we spent 20, 30 years empowering women, training women, empowering women, training women that, you know, uh, 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 the, when they're shooting on the street, it doesn't differentiate between a woman who's empowered or not. So for the answer of what parliament can do, the willing parliamentarians is to begin creating legislation enactment of inclusion policies and change the narrative and say, this is what is needed. This is why women are not entering politics. They're scared because the decision making of politics is very informal. This is a country where parliament doesn't deliberate strategy. There is a national dialogue table where 14 warlords put their guns aside and go discuss how are gonna women infiltrate these spaces. So we need to change the spaces, inclusive policies via elections, or the workplace that would with time automatically allow those women capable and competent and willing to enter without fearing their lives. We still Thank vote you. where our husbands are and our fathers are. We're not even recognized. Among us differentiates 15 religious courts. So some courts legislate child marriage, others prohibit divorce. This is how bad the structures are. I think this needs, and this platform is to say, this is where the conversation is, right? And while congratulating, but instead of spending the next thousand years counting how many succeeded, let's count how many laws we've enacted, how many employers have become inclusive, how many political parties today, what is more important than the new MPs, equally important is that behind them, there are structures and platforms that are trying to change the political culture. Let's start counting these. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Lynn, over to you for... Um, yeah. yeah, of course, Carmen, you covered a lot of uh, important points, almost all the important points. And, and uh, I want to say that there is no doubt that the presence of able women within this legislative world will contribute to more equal and free discrimination law for women and girls, at least a bit, at least to show there is a gender aspect to it, at, at least to put to push a uh, gender lens to any law, to any legislation, to any even project. Uh, female legislators, they have double human rights responsibility in order to push the passage of law related to human rights, to personal status law in Lebanon, which is very bad. Uh, we, got, we talk about inheritance law, we talk about the freedoms and many other laws. Uh, there are two major legislation that women need in Lebanon. One of them is the, um, uh, as you said, it's a nationality law. We say we're still not independent creatures. We still rely on uh, male. We still rely on the father, the son. This is where we, we, 
we vote, as you said, Carmen, based on what, where our father is registered or where our husbands are registered. The second one is a unified personal law. It's all over the place. Uh, uh, Medisa work on this project, trying to find existing personal laws and how they affect women. I have to go from one court to another. Some of them don't even have documents that can share, be shared with me. So I'm talking to lawyers, asking them, begging them for information that they don't even have. So that's part of the problem. If I'm, as a researcher, can find them and talk about them and analyze them and put them out for the public, how could anyone else do? How can we have this transparency? How can we change? How can we improve if we don't have all of that? Uh, another aspect, uh, Carmen, you mentioned all the great points. We also have the, um, the politics in Lebanon is a family business. So we saw, we saw that in the Baalbek between uh, a lot of candidates with Zaitir and Dima. Her family devoured them. They decided, they went public and said, we do, we do not support our girls. We do not support these women going for election. We do not support their roads. Why do we need that? We still need the family approval, even to go into politics. We still like, if they do not approve, they're not gonna be voted for. They're gonna be pushed aside. And uh, nothing is gonna change over and over again. We have the same people, they support the same people. Today, there was this article about um, a woman speaking out from during civil war about facing rape and many other uh, violence, yet still we still vote for the same people who did that. So that's a big note. Even as women, we're almost half of the Lebanese population, yet we voted for these people who already hurt us, who, who created this violence. Uh, I'll end it here. And, and um, it's taken this long for many of these women to actually uh, speak out openly about the horrors of the civil war and the utilization of rape as a, as a weapon of, of in, in during the civil war. Uh, yeah, we so know the Ayyub culture, again, we go through that, the Ayyub culture is like, no, don't speak about this. No, don't tell anyone you were raped. Don't tell anyone you're abused. We, nobody should need to know about that. And then nothing changes. It's the culture of shame around that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. it, it, um, it is a, it's predominant elsewhere too, but it's certainly um, more of a prominent feature in, in our societies in, um, in the region. Um, so looking ahead now, um, you know, the, the, the space for uh, politicking and, and expanding that uh, sort of, you know, or playing politics um, is really limited because there are very pressing economic uh, realities that have to be addressed. Um, and, you know, women are, of course, you know, perhaps should be part of that conversation, at least with those who have been um, elected. Um, what is it that you believe should be the one key issue that has to be at the forefront of their agendas, particularly when we're talking about the new um, the newcomers that are still, you know, basically getting their feet wet in the political game. Yeah, I mean, I, I just want to comment also on where Lebanon is at. Gallup says we're the second most depressed people in the world after Afghanistan. I think that very often in our political science uh, circles and think tank circles, we forget the mental toll it takes for women and particularly women in activism. And it's very heavy, it's very sad when we speak about rape and horror and poverty. These are our families, you know, these are the, the pension of our fathers, these are our aunts and ancestors. And so I think that, you know, factoring in how burnt out most people are um, can speak a little bit about why this moment is particularly difficult. Um, there is always a room to maneuver, and I don't think that Lebanon will enter into that really dark, shrinking civic space, but I think we're nearly there. And that taken into account, I don't think, I, I don't think there can be, I know this is cliche, there's not one thing, Marissa, that they can do. I think that the new MPs can establish a new method of working and fix, reconcile the relationship between a parliament that used to shoot at us to a parliament today that is open, that will listen. 
Second, in terms of setting the agenda, shifting the conversation from vulnerable people, including women, to structures that stop counting how many women made it to the finish line. Let's start counting how many organizations are being fair to women, how many laws we are able to change. And I think third, beginning to address some legitimacy in front of the international community that would include members of the Lebanese diaspora, because today Lebanon is an illegitimate partner. I mean, whenever I tell them we want to work on renewable energy, they say, yeah, but pick up your trash. I mean, we have no credibility after what happened. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what the new MPs can realistically aspire for in the next four years uh, in putting back Lebanon in the map, gaining citizen trust and gaining you know, the world's trust because what the warlords have done is really tarnish our reputation, exhaust us, beat us. Uh, and I think this is a moment to reckon with the real structure so that we can establish something that's not that's not at least because I, I've been so disappointed. I don't want to be any more gullible. No, something that is built on so solid grounds. And the issue of data, I think, is very important beyond doing research for academia. I mean, can you imagine you don't have a census? You don't know how many people live in a city that exploded, how many people have chronic illnesses, how many people have cancer? How could you do any recovery effort? And I think this is systemic on behalf of the government that they don't collect data and document and share. And so I think. I think the extent that we're really structural, we can establish, we, I'm saying, because citizens have a part to play. We shouldn't only sit and ridicule the new members of parliament. We can be constructive. Um, so the extent that we can together say that the problem is structural, I think it would be the, this would be very different than what happened after the war, because it, they didn't consider it structural at the time. They shook hands, they did an amnesty, and they started building you know, uh, ski resorts. So I think now we're at a moment to say there is a structural problem, and this small thank efforts you. will not fix it, from women all the way up to the port explosion. And thank you, Carmen, for also highlighting this um, this you know resilience fatigue every time there's um, yet another crisis that lebanon um basically basically experiences uh it, it's back in the headlines unfortunately for the wrong reasons because of you know whether it's a port explosion or, or any other political crisis um and then we hear about you know the the resilient lebanese people but there's so much that these resilient lebanese people can actually um can actually take. Uh, and the so politicians are resilient. The regime is resilient, not the people, because it's impossible. How could you hide such mass crime and then be able to show up? And they, they are really the source of resilience. Like Lean is saying, it's amazing. How do they get people to vote for them? They are resilient. The, the, yeah. the rest of us, we're survivors by chance and we're trying to make do. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. That's a really important point. Um, uh, and, and, and perhaps that gets me to, you know, um, another question to you, um, Lynn, uh, particularly regarding, you know, how to reframe the narrative around Lebanon um, as a Lebanese in the diaspora who has close connections to Lebanon. So how, how do you see this narrative being reframed and what role can you play in the diaspora? Yeah, uh, just to add a quick note uh, to the previous question, uh, I want to say that not all the elected female representatives enjoy their freedom to advocate for women's issues or to push boundaries outside their party's uh, traditional views. So that's another point. Out of eight women, four of them are uh, they, they're, they're affiliated to different parties. And we saw the problem with the quota when uh, Hinaya Zedin, she won also this election. She, at first she didn't approve the quota law for women in parliament. And then now she approves it and she pushed it, but her party didn't approve it. So, and despite the disapproval of her party, she kept pushing for that. And which is very important. The quota is important for, um, to increase women political participation in Lebanon. If they say we don't have enough women, at least we push them to find women who are able to do that. There's a lot of organizations that work on that, especially 50-50. Again, uh, they're trying to push for the quota, 20% women uh, in the parliament and 40% uh, among the candidate list. That said, um, I think the importance of diaspora work, work and um, involvement, we saw, we saw it in this uh, election because we actually shifted the gear. Nobody thought, eight people are gonna win, eight, like nobody thought, sorry, 13 independent 
uh, candidates are going to win. And most of this came from diaspora work, from diaspora effort and diaspora hope for the better Lebanon. So that's where our job is. This is our job to keep advocating for change. We see things differently from afar. We're not affected by this, all this emotions that they present, the, the religious affiliation that they want to keep, uh, keep following, want us to keep following because they protect us from the other. Who's the other? My neighbor? I don't get it. So be in a way, give us a different perspective and give us the, I want, this, I want to say the strength and the power to create change within country, especially there's more Lebanese outside of Lebanon than in Lebanon right now. So let's not underestimate the power of diaspora. Let's not underestimate the power of their votes and the way they're going to push, the, the, how they're going to push the narrative, how they're going to push the agenda, how they're going to change the whole system. So 10, 10 years of work so far, they changed the rhetoric and the mindset, especially among, um, among youth, among, among uh, diaspora community. 10 years, uh, 10 more years, we're going to also change the whole system. I'm, I'm hoping for that. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right on point about the importance of the, um, the diaspora, not only in terms of, um, you know, the remittances, because that's a huge um, aspect to it. But we've seen how so many different diaspora members, organizations and groups came together after the port explosion. Um, and I think that is very emblematic of how they're able to organize so quickly and be part of the solution. Um, so uh, I, I, I want to ask the last question from both of you as uh, President Biden heads to um, the region. Um, he will not be visiting Lebanon, but he will be in the Middle East. Uh, but I know Lebanon is on many people's minds in the region, particularly those who um, are uh, fearful and uh, aggravated by Iran's role in Lebanon. So if you had 15 minutes with President Biden before his trip, um, what message would you give him on Lebanon? What should US policy look like on Lebanon? Carmen. I was going to ask Lynn because she's she's DC based. <laughs> she, <laughs> she, she might have dreamt of this. I, I, I didn't imagine this question. Um, I think for all world leaders, we cannot have a foreign policy like Canada's feminist assistant foreign policy or US working on anti-corruption. We cannot have such foreign policies and expect people with no competence, with no interest to implement those policies. I think it's, it's beating around the bush. It would be very similar to continue trying to empower women or refugees or any marginalized community in a country that's actively trying to kill them. So I think we need to look at structures, look at policies, find a way to reinstate accountability. How could there be 3000 tons of explosives on the Mediterranean? And then two years later, people are forgetting. So I think these are, and these are issues. Look, Lebanon is a tiny country in a very extreme context, but these problems are not Lebanese problems, problems of inequity and violence against women all over the world, corruption, lack of safety, I think that if we can begin to break the cycle in Lebanon and change the narrative, Lebanon can actually be a good example for other countries. Unfortunately, there are more and more extreme contexts in the world are happening, not less, including most recently Ukraine. So maybe Lebanon could be a historic precedent of that's not how we do it. This is how we need to do it. That could be more relevant to other places. Um, I think that would be my message. Thank you. Len? Um, I would say look at Lebanon, um, kind of like what uh, Carmen mentioned, it's, let's not compare it to other countries. Let's not, let's not try to, we talk about this also in gender, let's not impose what, what worked for other countries in Lebanon, because it's a totally different uh, structure, totally different dynamic, and requires a very specific um, actions. What are they? Well, as Lebanese people, we say like different, uh, different uh, people in power, people who have the skills to actually run uh, the country and take it to the next level instead of keeping us where we were 34 years ago. So that's one thing. So I, I would say to Biden that um, to not compare Lebanon to other countries, to provide solutions that are 
country specific instead of first region specific. It's, it's also it's different from the other from the rest of the region, and it's different from the westward. So it's not the same solution won't work in Lebanon. And accountability. It's one of the important aspects right now for Lebanon. If we start with accountability, if we start, yes, everybody, we have a freedom of media. So everybody trashes everybody on the media, but that doesn't help. We need actual accountability for every action they do. I can go on and talk about anyone I want in Lebanon. I can still go back to Lebanon and nobody's gonna hurt me, but nothing is gonna change. Mm -hmm. So I would say accountability, I, that's the, personally, that's priority. Both of you really highlighted this governance piece, uh, which is at the heart of basically the structural reforms that Lebanon um, needs that continue to be um, deeply entrenched in this um, sectarian political uh, landscape. Um, thank you so much to, to both of you, uh, Carmen Jiha and Lynn Munzer, for your insight. And we look forward to continuing the uh, discussion on all things Lebanon, but particularly injecting more voices of women to be part of the solution. Thank you.